Welcome to the show, I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. The Ironman race is a 3.9 kilometer swim, 180 kilometer bike ride, and a 42 kilometer run all in one day. Competitors have 17 hours to complete this race and it's the ultimate test of endurance and athleticism. It's a feat that not many are able to achieve, let alone someone facing a disease like cancer. Our guest today is Mike Daw. In 2019, he ran his first Ironman race only to be diagnosed with thyroid cancer shortly after. Balancing a young family, a career as a mental health nurse, and a terrifying health prognosis, Mike decided to take care of his health the best way he knew how and began the long journey of training for an Ironman while undergoing his treatments. He joined me to share about his incredible journey and how his work is leading to thousands of dollars being raised for Young Adult Cancer Canada. We caught up via Zoom after his training run to chat more. Let's check it out. Hi, Mike. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Great to be here. Great to be here. I really appreciate this. I've been trying to get a hold of you for a while, but you have been a really busy guy. Um, you are a high-level athlete. You're also working at Eastern Health. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself for people listening so we can get a bit of background on you? Sure. Well, I mean, if I could just uh, say a couple words, I'd be a better public speaker. Yeah. Am I right? Uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm a uh, proud father of two, married to the woman of my dreams. Uh, I'm a registered nurse. I work in the mental health program at Eastern Health. And uh, I guess we're here today because uh, one big thing has kind of been a, a life curveball in the last little while is uh, last year when my wife was 33 weeks pregnant on our second, I was uh, diagnosed with metastatic thyroid cancer. So it's been uh, a few twists and turns in, uh, in the road, but we're still moving forward nonetheless. That's right. That's right. It's an inspiring story. And we're going to share that with people today because I think it's just such an important thing to share because you were given such a challenging prognosis at such an important time in your life. Not that there's any time in your life that is the right time for that, but you know, you were able to accomplish some pretty amazing things, but let's, let's talk first about your bit of your sporting background in 2019, you completed a triathlon, right? And maybe you can tell me about that experience and what a triathlon entails because it's pretty grueling. Well, <laughs> The funny thing, a quick backstory on that, um, I was never any of these things. I was a, I guess, like competitive amateur soccer player, primarily my whole life. I played for Mon, played Challenge Cup for 14 years. That's kind of how I uh, buttered my athletic bread. And on Canada Day 2018, like I said, I'm a registered nurse and I work in a community mental health program. Uh, I got hit by a vehicle at work. And Jeez. so I... Suffered a major traumatic brain injury, head, neck, and shoulder injuries. And that was the end of my contact sport career. Mm. Um, I've since had over 180 physical treatments for that injury. And I mean, I remember going to the Balance and Dizziness Center. And I mean, I'd close my eyes and fall over. Like, it was gruesome. Um, so I was very concerned about my short, medium, and long-term cognitive health. I went... And I was working with the wonderful Jake Warren there and seeing a pile of other people, Cairo, um, neurologists, ENTs, a bunch of people. Uh, and I talked to one of the ENTs that I was seeing. I said, man, like, like, what can I do here to like kind of improve my situation? And he said, you know, continue to play music, you know, sing and play guitar as much as you can, uh, which is fine. I mean, I, that's how I paid my way through nursing school. I used to be a traveling musician. Uh, to play Scrabble every night. And that brought out the absolute worst in my wife and I. <laughs> and he said to do the uh, endurance exercise. And then the next thing he said was just something I needed to cling on to because I just felt I was, I mean, I was having nightmares. I was having so much just replaying of the situation. I just needed something to take my mind off it. And so I, the, the doctor said to me, you know, you don't necessarily need to do an Ironman triathlon, but the longer you can go, the better. And I just, that <laughs> off the cuff statement changed my life because I didn't know how to swim. I hadn't ran since I was, I really hadn't done much since, since the car accident. I hadn't owned a bike since I was about 12. I was like, okay, we're going to figure this out. I need some way to move this stuff, move this stuff along. Yeah. So my wife gave me six swimming lessons for Christmas that year. I bought a bike off Facebook marketplace from a guy in Tennessee. Yeah. And then uh, I just put the work in. And so that's how I got into triathlon from a car accident 
And like I said, I learned to swim in February of 2019. And that year I did the Ironman in Mont-Tremblant. That's amazing. And that's, you know, that's so grueling. And just for people listening, can you run through how long each one of the legs are for the Ironman? So that people can- Yeah, so it? Yeah. Uh, it is a full distance Ironman triathlon is a 3.9 kilometer swim. It is a 180 kilometer bike ride and then a 42.2 kilometer run, which oh, is a full marathon. And you got uh, 17 hours to do it. And the funny thing about it is that like, if you miss a time cut off at any point during the day, uh, you've got like the timing chip around your ankle, they cut it off and you're physically removed from the course. There's checkpoints the whole day long. If you're not here at this point, you're done. If you're not here at this point, whether you're a pro, whether you're a hundred years old, whether you have no arms, no legs, mental, physical, uh, ocular challenges, the rules are the same. And that's what makes it so special mm -hmm. when all things are equal and you either make the timelines and you cut, make the cutoffs or you don't, it's mm -hmm. black or it's white. And yeah. man, that's what makes a finish. Who cares what the number is so freaking special. Yeah, exactly. Cause you can be taken at any time. I remember the the story, I think it was the gentleman with the son with cerebral palsy who was able to run the races in Hawaii and, and was competing on the world stage by uh, taking Rick and Dick Hoyt. Yes, exactly. So it's a heroic and it's, unimaginable it's, actually to be uh, what, uh, I mean, they're absolutely iconic in the endurance uh, sports world for sure. Well, that's right. And it's an inspirational uh, and, and an amazing feat to accomplish. And I guess, you know, you're coming off of a, a car accident where you were hurt instead of, you know, playing a, a sort of a role where you were, instead of taking action, you decide to turn that into action. You accomplish this amazing thing in spite of a difficult recovery. And then you got given the prognosis of cancer. So tell me about that and that experience. Yeah. I mean, it's not how you draw it up on paper. Hey, um, you know, my wife was 33 weeks pregnant at the time. You're trying to make things simpler, not like completely flip it on its head. Um, the way this all started was I was at work and a lot of our work involves going into meeting people in the community. So I was going into one of our clients' homes and I was going to give him his medicine for that day. And as I'm putting it on, I have this big gigantic head and these big gigantic ears. The mask that I had to wear to safely go in, you know, plus the robe and the face shield and that my gigantic head and ears don't exactly uh, jive with the standard issue mask. So it falls off my right ear. It's happened a hundred times before. But the thing is, that's the moment that I found something. So myself and my buddy Luke at work, we're about to go in. And as I was putting it back on my right ear, I just coincidentally grazed the right side of the base of my neck. And I felt like a golf ball in my neck. It wasn't my Adam's apple and I didn't know what it was. I'm not exactly the hairiest dude. So I don't exactly feel this part of my neck very often or ever clearly because I'd never seen this before. And all of a sudden my heart just sinks. Cause I'm like, man, I don't know what this is like. And I get him to feel it. He's like, man, I don't know what it is, but you're right. Like there's something there and it's not the same as the other thing. So this is completely out of my wheelhouse as a mental health registered nurse. So again, we've just got to start asking questions and referred to this person, referred to this person, you know, investigations, biopsies, and the quote that still rings in my head is we can all but guarantee it's nothing. Well, it's funny because after I took the biopsies uh, from all around my neck, which tickles quite a lot, by the way, uh -huh. uh, you know, I wasn't supposed to have my follow-up for results for like five weeks after that. Mm. And I remember it was a, about a week later and I called the clinic. I said, guys, like, this is on my mind from when I wake up to when I go to sleep, I'm awake half the night. Like I need to know the results of this. And they said, okay, we'll see what we can do. And they said, you got to come in first thing the next morning. The doctor needs to see you immediately. I said, oh, geez, like, what if I, like, what's going on here? And the funny thing is, I mean, it happened during a lockdown. So I couldn't go in with anybody like my wife couldn't come. And buddy, that was some long walk from the car up the flight of stairs up to the office. And when the doctor was looking at my chart, he was looking at it for a long while. And I'm there like trying not to psych myself out, yeah. get ahead of myself or anything. But 
he calls after looking at the chart, he calls me in and he says, Mike, how are you doing? I sit down in the chair before I even answered. He had his glasses off and his mask off. And I was like, Oh boy, <laughs> here we go. And like I said, like, I mean, you talk about, I mean, it's just a blackout. I remember just disintegrating into the chair. Nothing is registering after, you know, he, you know, breaks the news that I have cancer. I have no idea what's going on. It was like a complete, it was like watching a movie yourself, yeah. really. I mean, yeah. this is stuff you see on TV or in, you know, dramatic movies. There's this big moment that I'm like, holy smokes, I'm the name on the chart. What is going on? How did we get here, right? Yeah. And uh, holy smokes, he just pieced me back together. And then all of a sudden we was just, you know, time to make a plan as to what the heck we're going to do here. So it uh, it really went upside down. But, you know, that was also the time that we had to chart the course forward as to what we're going to do here. I'm here with Mike Da, who after being diagnosed with metastatic thyroid cancer, trained and completed an Ironman, which is a 17-hour endurance race. In the process, he's raised funds for Young Adult Cancer Canada and become an inspiration of what we're capable of achieving when facing adversity. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. I'm here with Mike Da, who after being diagnosed with metastatic thyroid cancer, trained and completed an Ironman, which is a 17-hour endurance race. In the process, he's raised funds for Young Adult Cancer Canada and become an inspiration of what we're capable of achieving when facing adversity. Let's get back to the interview. That's an interesting perspective that automatically your brain turns to action. And it was exactly what happened when you were injured before. It says you went through 180 treatments. So you obviously are very proactive on taking care of it. Like at first was your first thoughts, obviously a bit of devastation and shock, but it sounds like you quickly pivoted to seeing what you could do. Well, I mean, it's interesting because like I, I was aware enough to know that I had absorbed absolutely nothing during the conversation other than that I have cancer. I, cause again, as a registered nurse, though cancer isn't exactly my wheelhouse. Like I'm usually on the other side of that conversation. I'm usually the one having the name tag, or I'm usually the one talking about just a situation that I'm professionally trained in for, and to try to help and support and assist the person whose life has probably just changed through a, you know, mental health diagnosis. And you talk about absolutely feeling as though every amount of training, education, healthcare professional knowledge completely wiped, like not a brain cell was working uh, at that time. And I felt I knew absolutely nothing. I knew that I could barely remember anything of the conversation we just had. Mm -hmm. And I'm walking out. My parents, who were very, very nervous about this, you know, uh, I knew that they were out in the parking lot talking about it. So they're waiting. So I was just like, can you just write down the name of the cancer that I have, the variant, as much as you can, like, snapshot onto a sticky note. Yeah. And, man, that was a brutal walk again from up there in the clinic to go see my parents. And all I did was just hand them the note because I couldn't even get the words out. I mean, I'm thinking like, man, like our daughter's on the way, you know, I got a a, a birthday to attend here, you know, Uh, our young fella, you know, he was what, almost three at the time. I got better stuff to do. You know, we just moved into a house we'd built. I was pretty new to my job as team lead at, at, at work this is not exactly uh, the script right now. Right. So, you know, and then I went from there because uh, my parents were in the parking lot and holy smokes, that was a tough conversation. And then I just go and show up at my wife's work. She's also a uh, registered nurse. And, you know, when your partner shows up at work unexpectedly and I'm not exactly shy, I can't I look at her and can't even get a word out. I mean, she knew something was up if I'm showing up at, you know, and, and like waving her out of her staff meeting. Like, I mean, I just walked right in, like I own the place and just said like, get over yeah. here. It's the, yeah. it's the only ever time I've, uh, I've ever seen her cry actually, because she's usually pretty uh, zipped up emotionally and man, oh man, it was, uh, it was surreal. Yeah. What a, what a blur 
of it's it's as clear as it is blurry. Right. And, I mean, and yeah. man, I just think I think about that so much because again, like that's not where our focus needs to be right now. I need to be dad. I need to be like supportive. Like, uh, like okay, you can't reach your toes anymore. Okay, I'll paint them for you. Like things like that. Not like <laughs> this is this is going to get worse before it gets better. Right. And it's so interesting perspective being a healthcare professional yourself who's so aware of this the fact that things went blank when you got given that news that, you know, even somebody who's trained to understand these things, I, I can only imagine how shocking it would be for somebody without that literacy. Now, it, it, yeah. it, it might as well have been a conversation in, I don't know, Russian. Like it yeah. was completely nothing to me. I, uh, yeah. after that point, I just was lights on, no one home. Mm. And, and, and being aware of that, at least that's how I, got enough information to get transcribed so that I could, you know, then go and then, and, and when my next appointment is, cause obviously yeah. like things are going to get bumpy here for a bit. Right. So did treatment start almost immediately? I'm guessing that because you were young and healthy, you were well, young and had a recent diagnosis, but otherwise healthy, they probably got you in as soon as they possibly could. Well, I mean, the conversation was very, very positive um, and supportive and, 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 you know, I, I very much felt that I was seeing the right people at the right times, uh, you know, for the next week, I really don't remember. It's funny. Like I track all my runs on Strava mm -hmm. and swims and bikes and all that. And the day that I got diagnosed, I remember thinking about that after, like, I literally don't remember what happened for like the next week. And that afternoon I went for like an 11 kilometer run. I don't remember that. Like I like, but again, I guess I was just on so such autopilot of I need to do something that I enjoy here. And I, I do remember the night I got diagnosed. Uh, uh, I mean, she'd kill me for saying this, but it is the truth. I mean, my wife loves nachos. So I just did again, the things that would make me feel comfortable and normal and just undistracted by this shattering news. And I took her out for some nachos and just, I mean, it was a bit of a quiet table, but it was nice to be there with her and, and just to spend some time, you know, even if we didn't know what was going on at that time, but yeah. it just felt normal. Yeah. Yeah. There seems to be a real adaptation uh, with you that like, is sort of part of your story. And uh, essentially, like you must have been going through treatments, but at what point did you say, OK, I'm able to do these treatments, but I'm also still able to go for those 11 kilometer runs and training and say, I'm just going to continue on with my triathlon training. And I'm going to set this unrealistic but not unrealistic goal of trying to do a Ironman through all well, the treatments. When I was diagnosed, I was 15 weeks out from training for uh, Ironman Montreal Blanc 2021. Yeah. And. I was in wicked shape, man. We only had one kid then too. So it was like a lot easier to navigate these things. Yeah. Um, and I, again, my family comes first for absolutely everything. And we just figure it out and, and, and whatnot. But it was definitely easier to do that. And when I got diagnosed, I the other thing I remember that week, I think I ordered pizza for like four days in a row. Again, <laughs> I was surrounding myself with things that were familiar, comfortable, and just you know, just trying to find some stability. So that happened on August, sorry, April 29th at 9.50 local time. Mm -hmm. And that was a Friday. The following Saturday, I just said to the wife, I was like, man, I, I'm not in control right now. I've been completely flipped upside down. I need to find something to really kind of make myself refocused, just up for the battle here because obviously this is going in an unexpected direction. And so on about 36 hours of planning, uh, that Monday, which was May 10th of last year, I did a fully self-supported Ironman in my neighborhood. I went to Paul Reynolds swimming center at 7 AM, did the swim there. I came home, did the bike on the trainer, and then I ran a full marathon in our neighborhood. The funny thing is, is that again, this was during a COVID lockdown time. And like aunts, uncles, like close family friends, like just came out and like were on the trails and in the like, uh, the, like the, on the roads, like beeping their horns or just anything, man. It was it was such a unique and intimate and powerful day. And like some of the closest people in my life, and like some of the people, like I don't even know how they even heard about it from like the local triathlon community. Like just came and just were like literally in the back of the woods in Torbay on some random cold spring night. 
just supported me because they'd heard the news and they'd heard like what I was doing this for. And that was like the complete reset button of, okay, like let's take control here of things that we can control because if there's one thing that I've felt and experienced and learned through this is that cancer very much robs you of both control and the feeling of control in your mm-hmm. life. Because again, it's all just, okay, when's the next appointment? When's the next blood work? You know, it's never ending. Right. So um, that was a day that I just put the foot down and said like, all right, we're going to do this. And this is how we're going to work our way through this. And whatever comes, bring it on because you can do hard things. You really, really can. And, and to sell yourself short or to take the back door, I don't know. It's, it's made me realize like, man, excuses suck and just figure out something you love and, you know, uh-huh. figure it out. And that's easier too, when you have little eyes looking up at you, you know, all yeah. I'm trying to do is just set an example for the kids. Right. Yeah. And that's a hell of an example. And I wonder, you know, did it go through your head? Because I think some people think about this, about the strain you're putting on your body by training this way. Did you feel at any point that that was going to set you back in your treatments and your recovery? Or did you think the opposite, that this is good for me and it's going to help me in a million ways more than it's going to hurt me? Completely the opposite. No, I said this, you know, again, like I, I, man, like go putting yourself through a mental or physical challenge and coming out on the other side. I mean, pain is a big opportunity for growth. Pain and, and, hardship is an opportunity for resilience. I like, don't get me wrong. I hate everything about this. I'd (laughs) rather not be, Oh, like the guy who, you know, is making lemonade and and making this a better situation. I hate everything about this, Yeah, but I, you know, I can't just be pissed off every day and, and and miserable. You know, I I don't, uh, I have a meltdown and and a good scream when I need to, but the show got to go on here. Yeah. Yeah, And so, you know, like that day was just a day that I just decided that we're going to keep this moving. And, you know, I'm going to focus on having more good days than bad. And on the days that I can do something, I'm going to do it because there's been plenty of days through this that I can't. And not just exercise, just I can't do the things I want to do, you know, between hospital treatments or this or that. On Strava, I start every entry with, I get to run today, I get to swim today, because the appreciation of it is massive. You know, yeah, yeah, like hard to describe, yeah. I'm here with Mike Da, who after being diagnosed with metastatic thyroid cancer, trained and completed an Ironman, which is a 17 hour endurance race. In the process, he's raised funds for Young Adult Cancer Canada and become an inspiration of what we're capable of achieving when facing adversity. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. I'm here with Mike Da, who after being diagnosed with metastatic thyroid cancer, trained and completed an Ironman, which is a 17 hour endurance race. In the process, he's raised funds for Young Adult Cancer Canada and become an inspiration of what we're capable of achieving when facing adversity. Let's get back to the interview going through treatments you've done radiation i know but what other treatments have you done throughout the process so the funny story about that when i was diagnosed i mean the first the first conversation here is that like all right guys i just got diagnosed with cancer and the wife is very pregnant like we got to get this show on the road because i got daddy duty and i got a (laughs) birthday to i got a birthday to attend so when can we get this going i'm at my surgery and I've done the fasting and I've done a couple of days of isolation due to COVID real, uh, rules and restrictions. And I'm on the table and I'm medicated and this and that, and I'm asleep. And then someone wakes me up and said, Hey, uh, wake up. We don't have a pre-op. We don't have a post-op bed for you. I was like, <laughs> man, these drugs are wicked. Like, no, no, get up. We don't have a bed. I was like, Oh my goodness gracious. So I actually got rebooked. And when I had my surgery, it was supposed to be two hours. Apparently it was like six and a half uh, because it was just so much more tangly once I got opened up. And I was in hospital for a few days and I got out of hospital on Wednesday. Sorry, the surgery was on a Monday. I got out Wednesday night. Our baby was born that Saturday night. Oh my God. It was an absolute zoo of a week 
And again, like there's no breaks here. It was definitely an all gas, no breaks week. And we got to figure it out. I wasn't allowed to uh, lift over five pounds. Our baby girl came in at like eight pounds, five ounces. I was like, I'm uh, calling a personal here, guys. I got to hold her. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll deal with it. Yeah. Wow. That's a very stressful, but obviously amazing week. The fact that you can get surgery, you can be successful. And then your, your child is born at the same time. And, and so, you know, up till recently, it just in the news, you were able to rebook yourself back into that triathlon in Mount Tremblant and you've just competed in that. So you went through your treatments, you have a young family, you continue to work and you competed in that triathlon that you really wanted to do in 2021. Tell me about that experience and how you, how you made out there. Well, you know, I, I think that that's just been one of the constants through this whole year. You know, um, when I did my radiation, uh, sorry, radioactive isolation treatment last year, I was in the hospital for five days. And I mean, like the whole end of the, of that hospital floor is, uh, barred off. No one can come down. They got to put on the full suit. So, I mean, no, like there's no, uh, no one checking on you on surveillance checks. I mean, you're in there and the door is locked and no one comes down. Wow. So I was like, man, that's going to be a lonely room. So, I mean, I brought my triathlon bike into my room and I was on the bike the whole time I was in there. They said, the more water you can drink and the more you can sweat this out, the faster you go home. Copy. <laughs> I just brought my triathlon bike in right next to my hospital bed. When I was awake, I was on the bike. It, the looks I had when I was going in there, you wouldn't know if I was from outer space, but that's what I needed to do. And all I could think about was I miss my wife. I miss my kids. This is time that like I'm laid up in hospital and I'm missing out on, on time because that's the, the most important thing in all of this. We don't get it back. Mm -hmm. So that's been my constant. And it's just been the way that I've dealt with this. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, really wanted to challenge myself to the highest way that I physically or mentally could. And, you know, seeing this, the 2021 Montreal Blanc Ironman was canceled after due to, uh, due to COVID and it launched again this year. And I just said, man, like I need something to focus my stress, my pain, my mental and physical sanity on like, yeah. And, you know, that's just been a outlet for me that has helped me move through this stuff. Like, you know, uh, I've just kept moving and that's what works for me. I'm right. not going to say like other people should do this or other people should do that. Like, that's not my point here at all. Yeah. Yeah. That's what works for me. And it's worked in spades because it, you know, keeps me, uh, feeling as good as I can, you know, having my full thyroid out. I mean, the weight gain, the energy levels, the, I've had like nine med changes this year, you yeah. know, uh, I keep hearing, well, thyroid cancer, that's a good one to get, man, give your head a shake. Like that's yeah. not, that's not a thing. And I know that that's a well-intentioned comment, but like, it's not quite that simple either. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, I mean, my body has been completely not in control of itself in the last year. I gained like 34 pounds in the first month after the surgery yeah. while I was still active. Right. So, uh, you know, it's been my outlet and to just focus all that energy and to ha have something to really harness it towards was just an amazing opportunity because it just, again, to celebrate resilience to set an example for the kids you know there's 22 young adults in canada between the ages of 18 and 40 diagnosed with some form of cancer every day and to have found this outlet while preaching the good word raising awareness health promotion raising a bunch of money which is tremendous for young adult cancer canada yeah and to be able to just put all this into something from a nightmare into something far, far more positive has been one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. And all we need now is just some good results on the scans and we can friggin' move on for a bit. 
That's right. Well, the, uh, you, you mentioned that, you know, the challenge is that for everybody listening, your thyroid controls your metabolism. And if you're exercising and you're trying to maintain uh, fighting weight, basically, um, it's obviously going to be a challenge for people. But you mentioned some things that I think are takeaways for everybody. Now, not everybody is going to go run a triathlon, that's for sure. However, you know, your adoption of things that are good for you, I'm sure nutrition, exercise, mental health, all of those things are valuable lessons that can be applied to almost anybody facing that same situation. So, you know, what are some things that you think are important when it comes to some of those lifestyle behaviors and self-care? Like, for example, let's start with nutrition. And what are some things people should keep in mind if they're facing a challenge like you did? Well, it's funny to think that, like, I mean, I was running 40, 50 kilometers a week and I was still blowing up. Right. Like, I mean, again, feeling as though I was in no control of the situation. I mean, I had to look at those things. I, like I, I very rarely have any alcohol. Uh, I, I hadn't had a beer yet that whole year, for example, at that point. Uh, you know, I eat well, I cook my own meals, uh, other than, you know, we have a, a pizza nachos on Friday yeah. night. But like, there's things in this that you can control when all, it seems like all four walls around you are on fire. So, you know, hydration, good nutritional choices, balance, uh, getting a night's sleep when you can. Now that's tougher when you have a, a fussy <laughs> newborn like we had, but again, like making those things that you can try to buy into or control or at least positively influence. Man, small sustainable changes are better than any crash. Yeah. Like, because again, like those are really where you see the time. And the biggest, most underappreciated thing in any part of health wellness lifestyle is patience yeah. because it is so mismanaged and mispromoted and misunderstood in like social medias or anything like that because you know say for like obesity or something like that i mean someone didn't gain as much weight overnight so why would a a 14 day crash plan take it all up completely unrealistic impossible, unsustainable, mm -hmm. you know? So just trying to be patient with yourself, trying to be positive and, and, and like you can choose your attitude. Mm. Don't get me wrong. I have days where I'm miserable and I just, I don't know how we got here. I'm just pissed off at the world, but I really try to focus on choosing my mentality and having way more good days than bad. The strong mind will lead you anywhere. Yeah. I'd way rather have a strong mind and a weak body than a strong body and a weak mind. I'd take that 100 times out of 100. I'm here with Mike Da, who after being diagnosed with metastatic thyroid cancer, trained and completed an Ironman, which is a 17-hour endurance race. In the process, he's raised funds for Young Adult Cancer Canada and become an inspiration of what we're capable of achieving when facing adversity. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. I'm here with Mike Da, who after being diagnosed with metastatic thyroid cancer, trained and completed an Ironman, which is a 17-hour endurance race. In the process, he's raised funds for Young Adult Cancer Canada and become an inspiration of what we're capable of achieving when facing adversity. Let's get back to the interview. All right, Mike, so you're not very old. You're 36 years old. You're a puppy compared to me. As a result, you've attracted some attention from uh, Young Adult Cancer Canada. Can you tell me about some of the work and, and how that relationship was kind of fostered between the two of you? Well, the funny thing is that, like, I mean, I had met Mr. Jeff Eaton from Young Adult Cancer, their supreme commander, uh, <laughs> through a lot of different things. You know, I, I had, like, I'm, I had volunteered at a bunch of their programs. You know, it's such a well-known and well-respected group mm -hmm. in the community provincially and across the country that, you know, Jeff had also come in and uh, spoke to our class a couple of times when I was in nursing school and, you know, we knew who each other was. And last fall, I had a super sneak attack birthday weekend for my wife uh, about a month, month and a half before my radiation isolation treatment in the hospital, because, and I said to her, like, I don't know how I'm going to feel in a month when it's your birthday. So like, I'd rather get ahead of it. Uh, she absolutely hates surprises, but I threw <laughs> that to the wind and just took the whole weekend to celebrate how awesome and supportive and easy on the eye she is. So 
funny enough, we started that morning out on a hike and in the middle of the hike at nine o'clock in the morning or something, who is walking around the same trail we are, Mr. Jeff Eaton, all 11 foot tall of them. <laughs> That's and, true. Uh, and he said, and I said, you know, he's like, man, I heard some, you got some stuff going on. I said, funny thing, I got to talk to you because I got this idea that like, I want to channel everything I got going on and I want to make something far more positive out of this nightmare. Left it at that. And that week we got together for coffee and I told him about all the great stuff I did for Shanine's uh, birthday weekend and how she was ready to kill me. But anyway, life goes on. The point is I met with Jeff that week and I said, man, like exercise has really been helping me through this. It's kind of been my, just my vessel for coping, for mental strength, for physical strength. And this is what's working for me. I really think there's an opportunity here for some positive messaging, for some positive uh, engagement, and definitely for some, you know, I really think there's an opportunity to raise a lot of awareness here because I'm not shy. I mean, I've made the decision to talk about this. Let's mm -hmm. go. And he said, okay, well, you know, what do you want? The whole team, you know, has been so helpful in just giving me the keys to the castle uh, and just supporting every single thing. I launched what we call the Get Active Challenge. Young Adult Cancer Canada is more commonly known as YAC. Activity has been my way through this. And I launched what got called the Get Active Challenge, you know, and I just challenged anybody with anybody, uh, any age, to find some activity you enjoy, whether it's running, dancing, swimming, any intensity, any duration, you know, like the, the numbers on the clock don't matter. Just mm -hmm. move your body, find something you love and just do it. And, you know, and I set the goal that together or apart at the Cape to Cabot, which is a very famous local 20 kilometer road race, you know, I was going to dedicate every step and every ounce of that to the 22 young adults diagnosed with cancer in Canada every day. And I carried the Young Adult Cancer Canada flag up the hill for the very last mile to really make it a visual representation of resilience, standing up for yourself and the whole young adult cancer community. And, you know, it was a very emotional day. Uh, I had a few uh, leaks coming out of the eyeballs that day and they were freezing <laughs> solid because it was a cold one, man. Yeah. But, you know, it was, again, just trying to work with what you got and make it a, uh, a better, more positive message and to turn it into something. And I guess I just kind of doubled down on that by really channeling the exact same energy and the exact same messaging and focus towards getting ready for Ironman Mont Tremblant 2022. Yeah. I mean, there's no, like, this is not news. Energy yeah. is created through exercise. You know, moving your body feels great. Mm -hmm. uh, and just finding something you love. If you hate running, don't go for a run. Maybe find something else you love. Yeah. But the point is that, like, that's what's helped me. I was just speaking to my own experience and really, just really, capitalizing on the days where I felt well enough to do these things. I mm -hmm. hate everything about this, but like, I also realize that I have the opportunity to hopefully try to treat this and see the right people. Um, I'm not okay with just living my life in the perspective of, well, it could be worse. Yeah. Well, it could be better too. And let's try to make it better. And let's try to, you know, proactively go after exercising and, controlling or influencing the things we can. Mm -hmm. And that's where this whole thing came from. And, you know, I'm yeah. very, very proud to say that like, you know, as this whole activity uh, based initiative and fighting back through not just cancer, but just life. I mean, this is the most yeah. simple message applied to any situation. You know, we've raised over $12,200 right now. Wow. And I could not be more proud of this because, you know, I'm just trying to make this situation more positive. I hate mm -hmm. this. I'd rather not be in this situation. I'd mm -hmm. rather not be having these conversations, you know, 
it's weird going to the cancer center and everyone's looking at you. What's that guy here for? Yeah. I've never smoked a cigarette. I really don't drink anymore. Uh, I've never done a drug in my life. No family history. I don't know how we got here and we're still here. It yeah. stinks. It but does. again, you, there comes a point where you got to just pull the socks up and go to work. Well, I mean, and that's the other thing about what you're doing. It, it didn't just stop at working with Yak and, and doing fundraising. You guys are actually documenting this so that other people can share in your story. Tell me a bit about the, the project you're working on for that. Well, once I, I mean, cancer is a very personal journey. It's, I've always talked about since my diagnosis, finding my like one size fits one, mm-hmm. uh, because again, it's such a widespreading diagnosis there's so many different prognoses and there's so many different factors that can play into what it looks like and for me i've recognized that i have the ability to keep moving i have the ability to keep doing a lot of things i love often not all the time you know there's setbacks and there's like i said hospitals and you know when i had surgery and things like that and you know a a mid change that you know (laughs) knocks me on my butt for a couple days but i am focused on having more good days than bad Mm -hmm. and when I made the decision to start talking about it, like, uh, again, like, like Jeff asked me, he said, you know, you're the furthest from shy. Would you, would you think about doing a documentary about it? I said, geez. So, you know, a little family team meeting at dinner that night, and we made the decision that like, you know, I mean, you talk about vulnerable, like Mm. coming out to your, just the, (laughs) the big wild world out there about like a health crisis, like there's vulnerability and then there's opening up full blown about the hardest thing you've ever gone through. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I'm very proud to say that we've been tracking this for about a year now, a little over a year. And the one rule I said to Roger Monder, who is a uh, mm. brilliant filmmaker that we're working with, with up sky down films. Yep. Night one, film one i said there's one rule i said if we're going at this like you're gonna need to be able to just ask me anything if we're ripping the band-aid off here let's go nothing's yeah. out of line nothing's off limits you're not going to offend me we're past that point like if we're talking about this let's go i choose to be positive every opportunity I get like long before this, I was a professional mascot for six years for God's sake. (laughs) I, I choose to be focused on the positive stuff, but it's a very, very honest, transparent uh, look about my experience, Shanine's experience, close family and friends, and also like talking to uh, some of the healthcare professionals that I've been seeing through this because, uh, I'll tell you, it affects a lot more than just the person whose name is on the chart. Mm, and, you know, mm-hmm. it's been an amazing opportunity, again, to harness all this stuff with so much emotion coming in to have an outlet to talk about it. First and foremost, I'm not trying to sound selfish, but it's been really helpful for me. Roger Monder has basically been my untrained psychologist, uh, right. you know, with the camera in his hand. Yeah. But, you know, if this uh, is well received or resonates with other people, then that's an absolute bonus, man. Uh, you know, because I am so blessed and fortunate to have, you know, the love of my life in my corner, uh, two beautiful kids, wonderful parents that have set a great example for us and a great circle of friends. And Mm -hmm. I still feel like I'm on an Island with this a lot of the time. Yeah. I can't imagine what someone without some or most or all of those things in their life must feel like i can't imagine if i can feel that way my goodness there there must be some pretty isolated souls out there so i just made the decision to talk about it and let's go this is yeah we're we're gonna do this that's great i can't wait i'll be sure to share that with our audience when that does come out because that'll be a very inspirational story to share and i i really appreciate you taking the time today to share your story with us i know it's a very vulnerable position but i think it's one that's really important to share with people so i just want to say thanks so much for joining me today mike and and continue the great work good job you know thank you very much i uh again i hate everything about this but we're working with it and you know, all roads lead to Friday. I, I'm in active treatment now, so we really uh, fingers crossed for some for some p- good results on Friday. And my goodness, what a party we're gonna have! 
That's great. Well, I'll look forward to raising one with you. Cheers. Cheers Thank buddy. you for having me, Mike. It's a pleasure to, uh, to talk the ear off you for a bit. I love it. Anytime. You're welcome back anytime. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you to Mike for joining me today. For a bit of context, Mike had a radiation treatment just a few hours before our interview. But because the more you sweat, the quicker the radiation wears off, he had to go for a run before our chat. That kind of bravery and positivity was the reason why I wanted to share his story with you today. I know that not everyone has the mindset to achieve what he has, but I do hope that his story provides some motivation to anyone listening that may be struggling with their health. So congrats to you, Mike, and the team at Young Adult Cancer Canada. We look forward to seeing your documentary when it's complete. That's our show this week. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. We'll see you back here next week for another episode of The Wall Show on your VOCM.